what, I, what I like about this panel is my, my whole history is began with manufacturing and I, I love seeing things come to life and how logistics happen and how an idea can go from design to an actual product and I think if anything, this Internet of Things world promises us this to be automated more than anything, and uh, we live in a li living, breathing world. So I'd like to begin with asking each of you, um, just each of you come from a diverse company that's just different from one from the other, but eventually your technologies will overlap. So, um, Kat, I'd like to maybe begin with you and um, talk about the, how you guys at Maersk are looking at this Internet of Things world, because I see shipping containers, but I see sensors and things as well. Yeah, so um, five years ago, we started um, looking at... Uh, wanting to create a solution for our refrigerated containers. We'll call, we call them reefers. Um, we basically wanted to figure out um, what if we knew everything that the reefer knows. The reefer is a, is a quite intelligent box that uh, controls temperature, power supply, um, and return supply as well. So we started developing um, a solution that, that uh, enabled us to track all of the, these refrigerated containers that we have in our fleet. And now, five years later, we have installations um, on uh, nearly 270,000 um, uh, containers, as well as satellite installations on both our, our vessels in the fleet. And uh, that means that we get a lot of data. Um, and, uh, and that's really one of the things that is, uh, is mask lines um, take on, on IoT, is uh, first of all having a fully equipped fleet um, that generates data. And then as, as also some of um, the speakers earlier today talked about, um, our next step is now to figure out what to do with all this data. Because one thing is that you, get, you develop the technology, you do the installations, but you need to learn to get the optimum out of the data. And, and we, are, we are on that journey now, and, um, and uh, we, have, we have progressed uh, quite a lot, um, but there's still a lot more to, uh, to learn. It kind of fits in with my idea of like a company that makes hammers and nails for a hardware company could go to bed tonight and wake up tomorrow as a data company that kind of fits into the data will be the oil for Maersk. Sorry? Can you data will be the oil for you guys? To keep ah, the shipping. no. <laughs> no. Um, I, I mean, uh, the shipping industry is quite um, conservative mm -hmm. and uh, it took five years to get to a point from um, idea to fully um, implemented um, an operational uh, solution. And I mean... I think our challenge in the industry is that the IoT evolution is going extremely fast compared to the shipping industry. I mean, it, it might be that we, in 10 years' time, will see containers be lifted by drones and moved around, but we're certainly not there yet. Um, so I think there's still some, some time to go. Um, yeah, my, my imagination is already buzzing ahead. I think the robotic ships and ships docking by themselves and everything unloading, but that's pretty far off in the future. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. But of course, of course uh, it, 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 has to go. it has to go that way. But I, I still believe that um, there's still a long way before we see full automation because there's still always the safety element of having some people on board to, to, uh, to be able to ensure the safety is uh, where it should be. But I'm quite sure that having vessels that are maybe operated by machines, um, that's not too far out in the, in the future. Uh, Kai, could you tell me a bit about what IoT Works is doing around the whole Internet of Things, what, what it means to you guys? I mean, the approach your guys are taking in terms of the sensors and the systems integration and, and just making all the, these so many moving parts come together. Yeah, so um, generally speaking, from a system integration standpoint, um, the first level of digitization is done, more or less. Yeah? You started the journey, I think, a couple of years ago, and uh, the, the first track and trace solution now is up and running. That is an example, a good example, but what, uh, generally speaking, the, the, let's say the situation actually is in place. So uh, the next level of digitization means that we have to handle uh, ecosystems. And we have to talk, uh, to talk about and to think about what is the right business model to bring the right outcome yeah, or result uh, we have to bring in place. And that means that it, is, it gets much more complex than, let's say, in the, pa in the past. The technology is in place, um, so that is not an issue any longer. So now we have to take care for what we would like to achieve yeah, to bring the value yeah, in place, specifically not ending, uh, let's say, um, to optimize internal processes than um, to uh, enlarge and enhance the business to bring more value to the customer, to the end customer. Yeah, so all of that is uh, what we uh, take care for from a system integrator standpoint. It's complex because we now have to think about um, to bring um, engineering capabilities in place, meaning also to um, validate um, infrastructure uh, that is uh, like 
we have a technology um, agnostic, yeah, so to, to bring brownfield environments uh, also close to the new uh, business as well as um, greenfield activities. And uh, beside that, we have to think about system integration of, uh, of the next uh, dimension, yeah? meaning we have to take care for existing environments, uh, enterprise research planning systems like CRM, uh, um, systems like manufacturing execution uh, systems. And all of that it makes it very complex and needs to have a partnership of choice to start a new journey. Yeah? And this is something like the time where we are actually. Very good. And, and Donald, uh, Johnson Controls, um, the take you guys have on it, I mean, I would see this being a huge element of your business into the future. Yes, I mean, we are kind of an internet of things in our own right as a company. We've got three major pieces of business. We're the world's leading heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system provider, building management uh, systems, and then fire and security systems, um, and then also a very large power business that supports the car battery industry. And as you think of the changes in cars going forward, autonomous driving, anti-collision systems, etc., big power needs that are critical that you can't lose because catastrophic things happen. So lots of different parts of our business um, being connected in, in really interesting ways. Uh, we've got literally billions of deployed sensors currently, and every day we add more to that network. And what we're seeing is um, interesting things happen. I guess you know, the cost of sensors uh, going down dramatically, the cost of telecoms that connect all these things going down, and the cost of data storage, retrieval, security around data, et cetera. All of those drivers are moving in the right direction. And so you're seeing real momentum starting to happen because things that you couldn't do before because they were too expensive, even though you'd like to do them, are now becoming possible to do because the economics around them make it uh, make sense. And so a lot of the complex use cases that we would have looked at before and found difficult to do, we're now finding possible to do and can bring real value to, uh, to our existing and new customer bases, new services that we can offer on top of the kind of industrial products and services that we'd have traditionally offered. Very good. And one of the things, I mean, <clears throat> when I think about it a lot, of it, when I think about the mobile world we're in, you know, there's about 7 billion people on the planet and about 5 billion of them now carry mobile devices. I mean, this thing is going fast. But I worry about standards and I worry about security. We had some shocks there a few weeks back where uh, a d distributed denial of service attack was used, used uh, was launched using Internet of Things devices. Uh, you're talking about thousands of sensors, multiple ways of connecting. Um, how do you guys, each of you, see the way this will come together in a very organized way as opposed to chaos because it seems sometimes the machines are growing faster than, than people and ways of, of controlling them. So maybe start with you, Kai. Yeah, so I think that's a really good point. So what, what often will be missed uh, from my perspective is uh, to talk about um, the employees as well as uh, security. And this both are the things we have to take uh, care for in the near future much more than in the past. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a, a mindset change. Yeah? We have to be aware um, that it's one, one thing. And the other thing is that we often have to think about change management, generally speaking, yeah? because uh, we have some different, let's say, new peering roles yeah? from a partnership perspective as well as from a supply perspective as well as from the end customer perspective. This is really complex. And uh, the other thing is, for instance, if we are talking about the, um, the factory of the, of the future, meaning industry 4.0, so um, uh, from an end-to-end -end, um, process, uh, we are talking about uh, involving of uh, partnerships, of uh, end customer requirements, and so on, at, in the supply chain, more or less. Um, we have to open this environment much more than in the past, and that requires... Um, I think a mindset change also regarding uh, security issues. Yeah, so these both are the most important things we have to take care of. Very good. Katya? Yeah, well, I can, I can only speak more for our industry as, uh, as such, but I, um, I, I do believe that the way forward, um, a bit longer term, is an industry standard. <clears throat> it would be amazing to get to a, a point where it's not only our fleet that's uh, equipped with technology, but it's actually also all the terminals, it's also all our, um, uh, the truck operators, the port operators, um, it's everything. So you have this whole connected supply chain um, that will then enable, enable you to deliver a better product to the customers and also optimize uh, further internally. When it comes to security, um, of course, uh, that's something that, the, that we need to, um, to look further into. Um, but um, definitely what we are using right now is a private cloud solution, which, um, which we are very comfortable with. Um, and I'm not sure if, um, if, if, uh, if you see it differently, but for us so far, it's been working really well. Of course, if you open up for, 
for the broader uh, world to engage, you need to look at how you can um, you can optimize it. But um, for us right now, that's that's working really well. Okay. Yeah, for us, it's critical as a security company. It's a key component of what we do. So. You know, securing people's data is uh, always at the forefront of our thinking, and we do that at a device level when we're designing our components and our sensors, etc. And then we've got multiple architectures actually that we've got to cater for across our universe of products, from uh, data sets that are quite small and low bandwidth to huge video capture that we do within our security camera business. Um, so we've got multiple architectures, and we've got to deal with our own platforms. We also uh, work with uh, third-party uh, providers of products and also of, of cloud services. So we've just got to be very uh, security aware through that whole ecosystem and work with um, very reliable, trusted partners and also with our own uh, cloud platforms that we secure. And from a denial of service um, point of view, what you saw there was you know, uh, proliferation of uh, really cheap devices with low levels of security and built into them or very poor password protection. And those are the kind of things that we do as routine that we make sure that our, our systems, our products, our sensors uh, are protected on a multi-layer basis. So you should be able to deal with that, but again, it's a little bit that you get what you pay for. If you go for very cheap, uh, poorly secured uh, uh, devices and networks, then you're going to be vulnerable. Um, I'd say like most of us in the room, I, I grew up in a big healthy dose of sci-fi and watching robots and drones and things on, on cartoons and um, movies. Um, but now we're entering a world where people are actually innovating and they're building businesses out of drones and they're building businesses out of robotics. Um, it's like the future is happening as you would have imagined it 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But the thing is, um, it's, it's unleashing also a wave of entrepreneurship and also entrepreneurship within organizations. and. Also, that means change culturally within companies. Um, what, does it, what does it mean for each of your respective companies in terms of how you know, this broad canvas of connectivity and machines that you can draw on or you can develop or create, what's it going to do to the culture of your own companies? I mean, let's start with you, Katya, because you mentioned there that Maersk, um, traditional company with a, with a conservative mindset, yeah. uh, you move everything from cars to clothes to food, you name it. Um, security is obviously important, but, you know, it allows you to innovate and imagine a, a greater future or a more cost-effective future too. Yeah, well, I, I think when we started working on, on this solution in late 2009, um, it took quite some years before we had something ready that was um, presentable to the organization. Now we are at a stage where technology is rolled out in, in every single terminal and our entire office um, offices worldwide are using it. Um, but it's been quite an uphill journey um, to get to a point where people have accepted the fact that technology is now part of their daily work and it's now actually part of um, defining their daily work. Um, because the first thing that meets, uh, that meets you when you try to roll out a new technological solution, uh, at least in, 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 in our company, is skepticism. Mm. And, I, and I don't believe that you can get the full benefit out of a product external if you don't have the internal buy-in from your, from your broader organization. Um, but I think we're getting there because we now have the full fleet installed, the solution is working, and also because there's a lot of um, um, activity in our industry, in the market now. Other shipping companies are starting to, um, to do the same. Um, other terminal operators are starting to look into fully automated terminals, and a lot is going on. So, so people start to see that it is truly the way forward. Um, so hopefully, when we want to take the solution to the next level, people will be excited in, instead of skeptic. But it, it has truly been um, a heavy change management exercise the last, uh, the last um, four to five years. Okay. How's, how's um, Internet of Things changing culture in you guys? I mean, you've, you've built a whole company out of it. So couldn't agree more. Yeah? So it's an educational process, and once again, um, something like a mindset change is requirement, uh, requested. Uh, so if you have a look, for instance, to this old traditional manufacturing environment like automotive, uh, um, you, 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 you really can see that there is the necessity to, to, to change that in a, in a significant way. So what they did to, to, to do something for that is to establish this uh, 
departments around the CDO. Yeah? So that is something like um, very, very um, innovative from my perspective and necessary to do. We did ourselves uh, the same from a system integrator standpoint. So uh, HCL stands for um, system integration work. Uh, that is the core competences, uh, what we had in the past and what we already have. Uh, what we still have. Um, that's not only um, system integration, that's al al also business process outsourcing and we do um, application development and so on. And it was only a small gap, but we, what we have to, had to do and what we did yeah, uh, to close the gap now to uh, enter the next level, meaning digitization. Yeah? And that also um, we, uh, we, uh, we fulfilled uh, with uh, some resources we brought in um, based on a lot of experiences coming from the manufacturing or coming from the different kind of verticals. And that was really necessary and that is the mindset change within our company as well uh, because now we are working across um, uh, vertical internally, meaning we, uh, we have to, let's say, break down some walls yeah, to, to, to work against um, ring-fenced uh, um, environments, and that is really new. Yeah, that is new stuff. So from a system integrator standpoint, that's a similar situation like you have um, as, as a potential customer. So it's really interesting. To give you an example, you know, we provide you know, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems to buildings, but to make sure that you're tailoring exactly to the real demand load that's in a building, what you'd really like to know is exactly how many people are in that building at any point in time, where they are, what they're doing, the, the uh, heat load that they're bringing into that building, and be able to specifically then tailor the service provision of either heating or, or cooling to the building exactly um, to match that load. And that's something that's been really, you know, almost impossible to do up to now, but now it's becoming possible because we've got uh, all these different sensors that are monitoring these different things within the built environment. So we're actually able to match those different um, uh, things together, do a correlation, understand the exact profile of the building, and then provide services that cater exactly to what you want. So it's uh, you know, minimal environmental impact, lowest possible cost, maximum level of comfort and security that you can provide. And so that opens up a world of new things that we've got to do uh, within the, the built environment. So for us, it's really interesting. We've got very, very solid engineering going back for you know, decades. Um, and now it's building software services and end solutions for clients on top of really solid hardware platforms. The other thing that's really exciting for us is the amount of field employees that we have, tens of thousands of engineers and technicians in the field, going on site, doing installation, upgrade, maintenance work, etc. And the amount of really important, context-relevant, you know, searchable, usable data that you can have in their hands at point of use now becomes you know, far, far more powerful than it was before. The amount of truck rolls that you can minimize because they're going to do the right things because they're doing predictive maintenance, etc., instead of you know, responding to things that have failed. All of those things allow us to bring a great deal of efficiency and, uh, and much happier customer outcomes to the, the service level that we provide. So again, that opens up a whole lot of innovation that we've got to do as a company, but it's, it's work that we really like to do. About several years ago, people would have talked to me about cloud computing as a concept, and I would have kind of gone, oh, this is a great marketing buzz term and whatever, and now it's kind of like, oh, I can't really function without connecting to the cloud, and like your workers there, they need to connect to this data. Um, one of the things we hear about this time is, um, you know, sometimes it's described as the fourth industrial revolution, or we're talking about digital transformation, digital disruption, a lot of different terms for what's happening. Uh, if you go back about 100 years ago, where we're sitting right now would have been full of coal and ships and dockers and things. Some of the skeptics around the Internet of Things and the age of robotics and, and these, uh, all, all of these developments would say, well, what does this mean for the future of work? What will it mean for the future of people? You know, are people going to lose their jobs because of the technology or is there, are their jobs or roles going to be augmented thanks to the technology? You mentioned there are several thousand workers, hundreds of thousands of workers, who knows, yeah. out there at one time gathering data, using data. But what will it mean for the future of work? I mean, we talk about, you know, the new industry of IoT. It's an industry, all right, because people will make things. But when it's employed in, in, in our day-to-day -day lives, what will it do for the future of work? Um, Katya, for example, I'll start with you. I mentioned, I mentioned there are robotic ships and robotic docks, for example, and that's off in the future. But what do you think it will mean ultimately for the future of Maersk in terms of your employees and how they may be uh, repurposed with this augmentation of technology? Well, what we have seen so far, um, which is, of course, only... Um, touching a limited area um, with, it, with um, connecting our fleet, is that it's not like we are replacing the technology or the people with the technology, but the technology actually just puts us in a position where we are able to utilize our resources much smarter. Um, a, a quite concrete example is that 
before um, the remote container management solution, we had to monitor each and every single refrigerated container twice uh, a day. And also if that container is healthy, because we didn't know if anything was wrong with it. We just had to go and see if the temperature set points were exactly as they were booked. But with the technology, we now only have to look at the containers that actually need attention. And that means that, it, let's say we have a thousand containers in one terminal and we, look, we need to look at a hundred. That means that we, we can optimize the time spent just doing rounds in a much smarter way because there's a lot of other things that needs to be taken care of in the terminals. So I think right now we are at a stage where we are not, we are not substituting the people with technology. We are, we are just utilizing our resources much, much smarter. And I, I, I think that trend will continue um, some years, at least in, in our industry. Um, and, and usually there are people behind the robots still, right? So we will need the people, at least. That's my opinion. Yeah, Donald? Yeah, it's interesting. It's, I mean, it's hard to predict a long way into the future because the advancements in artificial intelligence and machine-to-machine -machine learning, et cetera, are still in their infancy, and I think there is going to be some disruptive change that will come from that, but at the same time, I think there's also going to be new types of roles that get created, so net, net, uh, I don't know, it's hard to call. I think it, there will be different uh, types of, of, of work available to people uh, as this uh, matures, um, but I don't necessarily see that there's, you know, we're going to go over the cliff and the machines are going to take over <laughs> because someone's got to make those machines intelligent, someone's got to connect them, someone's got to understand the use case, someone's got to do all the engineering that makes them effective. So I think there'll be lots of, of new types of, of engineering, new roles that cr get created to make the machines do what you want them to do. So, no, I'd still be optimistic that it's, uh, it's a bright and interesting future. Okay. Yeah, as it is a process, I think it's not a problem to achieve it. Yeah? So I think uh, you're right, and we need uh, to have, um, let's say, different kind of resources from a field service, for instance, yeah, perspective in place. Uh, that is an educational process as well. And that this uh, journey has to start also um, from a from sea level perspective. Yeah? So all of that has to, to, decide it there, to be decided there and then to, to, to fall down in a certain sense. This is the responsibility, of, of, from my perspective, of the, the future, uh, let's say, um, um, yeah, management of uh, each company. Yeah? So I, I think it's a, a tough um, responsibility, but we are on the way to, to do that. It's, it's, it is a journey and an education, education process. In terms of um, analytics and data, I mean, <clears throat> all of you are growing up really fast in this new world where um, you're gathering data in ways that, you know, are, are at a pace you haven't before. Can you give me examples of, how, of any surprises that you've gotten or any kind of insights that you've gotten through data gathering that have helped strategically push you in a new direction? Is that what you done? You're, you're going to pick a victim. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's, 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 um, oh, there's, there's just so many examples that I could, I could cite. Um, it's really interesting for us. Um, you know, in our security business, for instance, so we look at uh, perimeter security, so in, intrusion security, access control systems, and then we also have a big deployment of CCT, CCTV systems. And one of the things that you want to do is be able to cross-reference when uh, a system goes into an alarm condition because you don't want to respond inappropriately and you know, send people to scene or whatever. Um, and uh, the data capture and analytics that we're now able to do allow our systems to speak with each other. So if we see a door held open, we're automatically able to tell a camera to go look at that door and give us a burst of recording for the 15 seconds before that happened or whatever length of time you want afterwards so that you can cross-reference the two systems and say, mm -hmm. yeah, actually, that's a genuine alarm condition over there that we need to respond to, or no, that's a false alarm for whatever reason. And so the, the data that we're collecting and, and now able to have our different systems um, speak to each other and analyze that data in real time means that decision making gets really much, much better, that our responses are appropriate to the conditions that we're experiencing. Um, and that opens up other avenues as we look at all our other systems. We think, well, if it works over here, then it can work in these places and these conditions as well. And that's what we're doing is we're kind of migrating all that type of thinking uh, into our uh, entire universe of products and systems. Very good, Katya. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think one of the first learnings that we um, that we saw when we started looking at all the data that uh, we were now collecting um, is we, we didn't know where to start. I mean, we really had to we really had to put a specific team that has a specific skill set 
Uh, we call it advanced analytics, and it's an area that, that we want to focus a lot on in the company, um, because we quickly learned that just in, in, in the existing team, we didn't have the needed knowledge just to start analyzing all these different data, at least not if we wanted to get the maximum out of it. So, so of course, we have quickly identified some uh, core processes that, that we have been able to optimize by looking at the data points. Um, the data has helped us um, react faster, um, but we are still reactive, and what we're working on now is reaching a state where we can be proactive. Um, so, and we're not there yet, um, but that's, that's really what we, uh, we have high hopes for our advanced analytics uh, teams to help us get to that point. Um, because I think it's extremely important that you deal with the data in the right way, and if you just take a silo approach and, um, and, and you know, have predefined um, questions that you want to seek answers to, I don't think you get the maximum out of it. You need to flip it around and you need to say, just let the data work and then let's see if we can find some answers to questions that we haven't even thought about yet. And that's, that's the mindset that we are taking uh, in order to get the maximum out of it. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, so based on business intelligence and analytics, I think uh, we, we, sh we should not stop uh, with uh, measurement uh, in a certain sense. Uh, we should uh, try to transfer all of the data we are able to win into actions or, or reactions. Yeah? And that is, the, I would say, the future business. We are working on that uh, on a different kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of cases. For instance, we have one, uh, one interesting um, manufacturing case, meaning uh, with an with a, um, aircraft manufacturer, we installed a solution uh, with a lot of uh, full automatic um, results behind that, uh, meaning that the downtime yeah, of, of uh, aircrafts uh, from a maintenance perspective, we were able to reduce in a significant way. And all of that uh, is, is, is based on some processes we brought in place, meaning without any uh, human beings yeah, or interfacing, um, um, processes were, were able to start yeah, and back. Are, are, are able to, to start the back. And this is uh, something like future business that's really complex. You have to handle data from a historical standpoint as well as from, from a, a just, a, just a, um, uh, achieved, uh, assessed. Um, and that's, this combination um, lets, uh, allows us to, to, uh, to install such end-to-end uh, -end solutions. Because, and one of the things about it is also wireless. I mean, we, we hear a lot of different wireless standards coming into it, uh, Sigfox, NB, IoT. Um, which, are, I mean, I don't know if there's really a war between these standards yet, but is, if, if you had a preference, which would you guys be, be backing or betting on? Uh, Katya, I'll start with you, because you have the shippers, shipping containers moving around. <laughs> well, what we're using right now is, um, is through G2 and 3G as well as satellite. Um, and we are, of course, um, keeping an eye on the development in the market, but I would say that we are not the experts. Uh, it's our partners that are the experts, and we actually just we rely on you guys, to tell us what direction to go. Um, right now, we're happy with the structure, but we're also well aware that it's not, um, it's not completely future-proof. So, um, so I'm just excited to see uh, what way the industry will go. Kai, you're at the coal face of this. Yeah, so, so we're talking about the connectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, as long as full coverage yeah, is available, we don't care. Yeah? So I think uh, that is technology agnostic, what, what I mentioned. I think uh, we need to have a full coverage in place. Um, that could be based on Sigfox, near field communication system, cellular technic, or wireless LAN, or whatever. Uh, in a, um, I would say, um, fitting bandwidth, yeah, and uh, with a reduce of down of um, round trip times, and that more or less is available. It's for, uh, for it's for mobile environments much more critical because then we are talking about um, let's say the bandwidth we need to have in place all over the world with a full coverage more or less, yeah, based on satellite communication that is possible. Anyway, we, we can feel that if we have our long distance trips, yeah, now it's uh, possible to have uh, internet connectivity during that um, uh, flights, yeah. So this this is on the way to, to improve. I would say 10 years ago, we had a lot of problems yeah, to have that deep, deep in-house coverage as one topic. Uh, nowadays, it's not a problem. It's a combination of all. Yeah? And if it's, if it's not a, a possible to do that based on one carrier uh, service, we could do, the, do that uh, based on multi-hub systems. Not a problem. And the last word to you, Donald. Yeah, look, we're interested in, in all of them because we've got different architectures depending on the volumes of data and the distributed network that we look at, you know, across 150 countries in all kinds of end-user applications. We're in mines, we're in oil rigs, we're in gas exploration platforms, we're in built environments. So we've got to have, you know, different types of architectures to suit the end application that we're working in. So we're interested in all of them. I don't know that we've got a favorite. We've got, uh, you know, favorites in particular applications. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's developing. Provided we've got access and we can do it cost effectively, get at the data, transmit the data, secure the data, um, 
we're pretty agnostic. That's great. Donald, Katya, Kai, thank you very much. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.